Right, so I've already gone and collected something which is useful from the data book. So we've got an, an emission spectrum of mercury, the line at 310 nanometers, so 310 nanometers, is due to. Right, so if we look at the colour wheel, um, our smallest number that we have is 380 nanometers. I, can't, I mean, I expect you to know it's roughly 400, 700 nanometers anyway, but you have the data, so you might as well use the data book. So what we're saying is anything less than this number, so anything the other side of 380, is going down into the ultraviolet. And you've also got the highest number here is 750, and anything bigger than that is going into the infrared. Okay, so at 310, we're in the UV. Okay, so let's get rid of these two. Okay, and then you're told it's emission. So emission means that it's released. So there you go. And that's it. In which of the following changes would heating to constant mass allow the mass of water produced to be determined? Okay, so we are not looking at any of the things going in for a start. I'm just getting rid of all these so I'm not even confused by them. I'm only looking at the products. So what I want is something that I can evaporate off the water and find out what is left. Okay, so we have here a solid with a liquid water component. So if I get rid of this by evaporation, I will know what the final mass of this is, because I've got it to a solid, and I know how much water must have been left. That's it. Okay, these don't work because you've got a gas and a gas, and this is in solution. So I've gone and collected something that would be useful from the data book again. Which of the following reagents would be most suitable, it's not saying perfect necessarily, for the gravimetric determination of magnesium ions in water? Right, so if I want gravimetric analysis of this, I need to have something I can weigh. To weigh something, what I really want is for it to be insoluble. This is important, okay? So here we have our magnesium line going along here, okay? Our options are we're either going to go carbonate or we're going to go nitrate, right? So you should be able to see straight off nitrate is not a good option because we're going to end up with a very soluble system. So what we want is this one. So our carbonate that we make, the magnesium carbonate we make, is going to drop out of the solution, which is going to be useful for us, because then we're just going to be able to just evaporate off what's left, okay, and filter what's left as well. Right, so now we're left with, so it's these two guys are, are still in the running, so sodium carbonate and silver carbonate. So let's have a look at what they are. Okay, here's our silver carbonate, and here is our sodium carbonate. So if you look at this, you're like, well, I want to be able to separate these things out, my magnesium carbonate and the original. So this would be in solution, so I can get rid of that. So the answer is C. Straight definition stuff. Hund's rule states that. Okay, so Hund is maximum multiplicity. So this is just, you go parallel in any orbital and then you go pair as long as they are of degenerate energy. So in this case, because I've drawn P3, that's probably a P orbital set. Okay, so that's it. Uh, just to be clear, no two electrons in an atom can have the same four set of quantum numbers. That's Pauli exclusion. Oh, that looks nothing like the word, but you know what I mean. Um, and electrons occupy orbitals in increasing order of energy. That's your Aufbau principle, building up principle. And the energy of an electron in an atom is quantized is just a fact um, which you use to do your um, atomic admission and absorption. Okay, again, because the data book is your friend in the exam, I've gone and found something from the data book to help with this one. Right, so we've got which of the following molecules contains the smallest bond angle? So all of these are acting with chlorine. Chlorine is just bringing one to the party, as it were. Well, a gap to the party even more. It just is going to bond at one point. And we are looking at beryllium chloride, boron, carbon, and phosphorus. Okay. So we basically have a two, a three, a four, and a five. These are the ones that have their... So what electrons have they got available to bond as a pair? Okay. And then you just need to work it out. So we've got a two pair... So that's going to be beryllium on the inside, Cl, Cl on the other side. So that's just linear. And linear, you should know, we've got a 180 degree angle in this one. So it's pretty large. Okay, we go to boron. And this time we get 
are chlorines set up in a trigonal planar? Little triangly one. Okay, so each of these have a bond angle at 120, so potentially in. Okay, and then we've got our carbon tetrachloride in this one. So we've got our Cl, 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 and Cl. Now remember this this carbon is kind of in a the middle of the tetrahedral shape. So these this bond angle in here, 109.5. So currently the winner. Uh, until we bring in this guy. Okay, so if we put phosphorus in the middle, we get a kind of trigonal formation in the center. Okay, so that's coming out to our chlorines. And then we also have one projecting up, one projecting down. This is your trigonal bipyramidal. And what's important, obviously that's 120, the same as we had here, but this angle here is a 90 degree. So smallest angle is in this.